Hi, my name is Steven Sindoni. Welcome to another edition of He Walked the Americas. The stories in this series are from a book written by L. Taylor Hansen. Our story today is entitled The Old Chippewa Council. The Chippewa of the Great Lakes remember well the Pale Master. They say he gave them many medicine lodges whose signs and symbols are secret, fashioned from those across the ocean, and even today they hold secret knowledge. Let us now journey back into the past. This is where our story begins. Beside the shores of Michigami is the forest so called sacred in the state called Michigan. Before the wigwam stood Dark Thunder, kindly chief of the old Chippewa. He was gazing steadfastly westward toward the water reflected sunset and blowing smoke to the four directions. Toward him came the college student, the one the tribe adopted by blood rites and for whom there was warm affection. That affection was more than mutual. That child of the white race found all of these people charming. He admired the agile and cat-like grace of the dancers, the smooth silken skin of the women, the quiet beauty of their language, at times most hauntingly poetic in its phrasing. They lived in a world unknown to white men, a world in which the past was present, a past more distant than our histories. Upon their reservations, poverty-stricken and spirit-broken, the student was learning to see them through their own eyes as the ancient ones and keepers of the older knowledge. Theirs was a very rigid culture with patterns that ran back to antique cities all before the rise of Egypt. There were proper ways to address one's elders, to enter a lodge, even to ask questions. My father, why are you blowing the smoke rings? Dark Thunder finished his meditation before he took his seat and began his answer. Because if you look across the water which rolls from the bay we call Kiwana, you will see it is touched with sunfire. Yes, that comes from the clouds of scarlet which the sun paints as he leaves us to light the lands beyond the horizon. You learn well in the schools of the white man. You hint that there is another meaning? Yes, come and sit down here beside me. Know then that the fire path of the water is that travel by the spirits who leaves this realm for those beyond the sunset. Long ago there came to us a prophet. He asked each tribe to name him, for to him names meant nothing. So we called him Wisako, and we covered his paths with flowers so that he always walked on petals. Now he does the same for the spirits who leave us, and I was giving Watesi my blessings. Yes, I heard of her death this morning, a lovely young girl, her cheeks bright with fever. The coughing sickness of the white man, once such diseases were unknown among us, but something in our blood seems to invite them. Perhaps in the blood of white man is a substance which resists them, having been built up through the ages. Yet the blood of red man, having never coped with these diseases, does not have this resistance. Perhaps, but tell me of this prophet who paints the water with long dead blossoms. The same. What was he like? Where did he come from? Your desire for knowledge is a thirst never ending. Forgive me if I am too inquisitive, but I have never glimpsed this knowledge, and my time here is short. A summer vacation is of short sort duration to grasp even a fragment of it. I know, my child, so I will tell you, though seldom do we speak of the past during summer, perhaps because in the days of my fathers, when we lived freely in the forest, the summer was a time for hunting and the gathering of fruits, nuts, and berries against the rigors of the winter. Very well, let us speak of the prophet. He was bearded and pale of feature, without doubt a white man. His eyes were as gray-green as still green water and just as changeable in their color. He came to us one day at dawning and the light touched his hair was a sheen of red gold until it shone like newly mined copper. Yet he was not as the men of your people. This one was a god with high soul stature. If he touched a man who was wounded, that one became healed. His robe was long and white down to the hemline, which almost hid his golden sandals. Everyone wished to make him white robes, for then he would leave behind the old ones, and all that he touched was enchanted with his godlike power of healing. Did he bring other priests with him? No, he came alone. He organized the churches, changed the temples, taught the priesthood. Some say he taught them a secret language, with certain signs of greeting, I know not. 
Why do you call him the prophet? Because he not only walked among us, he also walked the realms of the future. Are you sure that he was not one of the black robes who came to this land with Columbus? I am sure. He came to us when we had cities more than a thousand winters before the days of the black robes and the long knives. When you had cities? Where are these cities? Below the cover of the forest. What a strange legend. You do not believe what I am saying? You think I speak to you with a forked tongue? Oh no, I do not believe that you would deceive me. I am enchanted with the antiquity. Where are these cities? The ruins have been scattered by white men. Then tell me the location of just one city. The city which we call the sacred is not far from here. Its history is longer than that of England's London. But, my child, you ask too many questions. If I had listened to my elders with half the interest with which you listen, I might have had more to tell you. But I thought too much of swimming in the blue sea and running races through the forest. My father, for what you did here, I thank you. Yet I must ask of you a very great favor. Find for me another chieftain who will speak to me of these cities. Why would you have us do this thing in summer when it is not our custom? Because I want to write down these stories. Just to spread them among the white man so that he can laugh at us and speak lightly of things about which he knows nothing? No, some day I may make a book of such stories, not for the amusement of white man, but for the teachings of your grandchildren's children beyond our time, many generations. Already there are few who can tell these stories. Are there any others around here that know them? No, I would have to bring such a one from a great distance. You see... Soon all these legends will be lost. I would know of these cities. I would speak to the future, perhaps beyond our lifespan, for a book is a bridge from the past to the future, upon which we stand for this brief moment. My child, you speak with the tongue of the red man, and knowledge beyond your number of winters shines from your words. Once we had books and priests to read them, but those were times long distant in the past. Books are of stuff which can be swept into oblivion, since then we have placed our stories in the chance of our people, but now even these are being forgotten. Your oldest books to us are but of yesterday, and how long may last these papers of your people? Yet you are right. The chants are dying. I too would like to reach other tribes of our people and share with them our ancient history. Is there still alive a chanter of the legends? There is one. He lives at some distance. Go now and let me think on this problem. Come back in eight days and we will talk further. I may then let you know the time of his coming and if he will be willing to chant in summer. There may be more than one and then there will be translators so that you may not miss the beauty of the language. Come back after the sun has gone down eight times to the horizon and speak of this thing to no other person. Then perhaps during a night when a certain star is shining we will journey back to the times of the prophet when the land was peaceful and we lived in cities. The student was new in the lore of the red man, yet one fact became instantly obvious. Thirteen was the prophet's number, although eight was also important, and five, the number of their difference. In due time came the night of the chanting. There were present many sages, proud old men of noble bearing, and apparently all of different languages. Their names have long since been forgotten, but never the drama of their movements and the melodic poetry of their phrases. Together these men made the past of North America in the days of the prophet come to life. Did Jesus walk in the Americas? The Chippewa Nation says that he did. Tune into our next episode for the conclusion. I'd like to thank everybody for watching the Old Chippewa Council.